Uh, turn with me in your Bibles now to the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And we're going to look together at verse 20. The Gospel of Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 20. And Luke chapter 22, verse 20 reads, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's pray. Father, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful day of salvation. Lord, what a beautiful day of renewal. And it's our desire today as we continue in your presence that you'll help us today to hear from heaven loudly and clearly. And Lord, for those here today who are already believers, my prayer for them is that they would be drawn closer to Christ Jesus than ever before. And as we preach this morning to prepare ourselves for Easter communion, I pray, Lord, that as each and every one of us approaches the cup, we'll do so with a renewed and steadfast love for the lover of our souls. We pray that we will do so with a heart and mind that is cleansed and right before God and ready to follow you with abandon. So we commit this time to you now. Please set us all aside and take us to a higher level. And I pray that you'll be glorified in our midst. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Today we're going to look at the four cups of the Passover, the four cups of the Last Supper. I preached a message several years ago having to do with one of these cups, and we're going to weave that into today's message and expand it a little further, the four cups of the Last Supper. Now, when our Lord Jesus and his disciples gathered together for the Last Supper, they were gathering to celebrate the Passover Seder. The Passover Seder meal tells the story of the first Passover during the life of Moses as he led the children of Israel out of bondage, of slavery in Egypt, and the Passover Seder includes songs and prayers, and basically participants will drink of four different cups of wine or grape juice. And the four cups that are drank from correspond to the four I wills that God promised the Jewish people in the book of Exodus chapter 6. He said, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. He said, I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And finally, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. So these four cups during the Passover Seder acknowledge the fact that God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. And together, whenever you put them all together, they comprise a step-by-step -step memorial of that great event, but not only that, anticipation of what is to come. Now let's take a look at the first cup. This is called the cup of sanctification, the cup of sanctification. It's consumed early on in the meal. Jewish people will acknowledge and celebrate and remember and they'll worship the Lord because he chose them because he exalted them, because he set them apart through giving of commandments. There's a prayer of praise that is offered before the cup is drank from. <coughs> now in Hebrew, the word for sanctification, <coughs> excuse me, is kadush. And so the cup has been known as the kadush cup and it's used to sanctify or to set apart every Sabbath as well as the Passover. And basically what it does is it reminds the Jewish people that God has set them apart from all other nations. The second cup, 
is referred to as the cup of praise. And basically at this point, they would read the story from the Exodus. And after that is read, the cup of praise is drank from with a prayer of praise to God for his faithful love and delivering them not only during the time of the Passover, but actually also throughout the generations. Think about everything that God has redeemed or delivered his people from. He has redeemed them, set them free from slavery in Egypt, actual slavery. He has rescued them from Babylonian captivity, from Medo-Persian occupation, from Roman occupation and control, and basically every other foreign country from that time. God has been faithful to remember his covenant that he entered into with Abraham. Now the third cup is known as the cup of redemption. And it is actually drunk after the meal. In the ancient world, redemption referred to slaves being purchased and then liberated. And so in drinking from this cup, the Jews acknowledged the fact that they once were slaves. That they were all slaves and had hard taskmasters. God redeemed them. He bought them back with an outstretched arm. And so Jewish people will praise God for freeing them from Egyptian bondage. Not only did God deliver them from those harsh taskmasters, but also from the constant reminder of pagan worship that surrounded them at all times as they were in Egypt. Remember that Egypt is always a picture of the world. Now the cup of redemption here, in this context, symbolizes what Jesus did for you and what he did for me. He shed his blood to redeem us, to buy us back from slavery to sin. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote these words. He said, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Now, we move on to the fourth cup. The fourth cup, in this time during the feast, everyone drinks of this cup, and it's it's near the end of the dinner. It's called the cup of acceptance. Uh, It's actually at at the very conclusion of the dinner, The cup of acceptance, or it's also called the cup of anticipation. And it celebrates the relationship that God desires to have with those who are his chosen. This is the cup that the Lord Jesus used to symbolize entering into the new covenant with believers. He did not drink it at that moment. I want you to remember that. You've read this passage a thousand times, those of you who have been in church, but this may not have occurred to you why he did not drink from that cup. We'll explain later on in, in a few minutes, actually. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them. He did not drink from it. He said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, Jesus and his disciples are gathered together. They're up in the upper room whenever this feast takes place. And very soon, they're going to be making their way outside of that upper room. Uh, I can see it in my mind's eye right now. They're going to cross over the Kidron Valley. They're going to ascend up into the Mount of Olives. And then very early in the morning, Jesus would be taken into the garden where he would be tried, convicted after that, tortured, humiliated and then put to death. And so Jesus had already shared with his disciples what is going to happen to him, and they were all very upset, obviously. He'd been trying to tell them this for a while to soften the blow, but they did not hear him. They could not understand. They tuned him out. He tells them something that would not only help them in that moment that they were feeling broken and very scared, but would help them in the future because it would bring to light exactly what he was asking them in that moment. The Word of God says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, 
that where I am, there you may also be. Again, we have to put all four of the Gospels together to gain context enough to be able to understand exactly what is going on in these moments. After telling them this, that I am going away, but I'm also coming back to receive you. After telling them this, their eyes would instantly be opened and it would become obvious to them that Jesus is referring to something in this moment. He is referring to Oriental marriage ceremony. This time in the upper room was very special to our master, the Lord Jesus. It is where he instituted the Lord's Supper. And he did something very special with his disciples. He takes this fourth cup, this cup of acceptance, this cup of anticipation, and offers it up to his disciples and invites them all to drink from it. And it is beautiful what is taking place here. Before we get there, I want to share with you, in case you have never been taught this, the significance of Oriental custom. First of all, you have a betrothal period. And in this betrothal ceremony, a covenant of marriage was literally established between the man and the woman. The prospective bridegroom would travel from his father's house to the home of the prospective bride. And there he would negotiate with the bride's father. And they would come to terms on a bride price uh, called a mohar that he must pay to purchase his bride. Now, the prospective bride and her family would all come together and the prospective groom would take a cup and he would fill it with wine and offer it to the prospective bride. And he would say the following words. This is my covenant with you. Take this and drink it. What he was asking her in that moment was, will you marry me? Will you marry me? If she took the cup and drank from it, then she was in essence saying, yes, I will marry you. I will enter into covenant with you. The groom would then pay the purchase price, And the new marriage covenant would be established, and it was established legally. In other words, to dissolve it, after that point, there would have to be a divorce. Although the marriage was not consummated yet. And then they would wait. And the the period of time that they would wait would vary, but it could be up to a year. And it was during that time that the groom would leave the home of the bride and return to his own father's house... And there they would remain separated from each other for a certain period. And during this time of of separation, lots of things would be going on. First of all, the bride would be uh, collecting items. She'd been collecting items her entire life to get their marriage started off. Uh, She would spend time uh, putting together her, her outfit that she would be wearing, getting herself ready for her husband. She would not be considered single anymore but she would be referred to as someone who has been bought at a price. Now, the groom would return to his father's house, and he had a construction project going on. He would be adding on to his father's house and constructing the dwelling that he and his wife would occupy. The interesting thing is that the groom did not decide when the home was ready or when it was time for him to go get his bride. He had to wait for his father to announce that. And at the close of the year, their father would announce that all the preparations were made and it was time for his son to go and get his bride. And at the end of that betrothal period, the groom would come and take his bride to live with him. This normally took place at night. And the groom and the best man and the other male uh, escorts would leave the groom's father's house and they would conduct this torchlight procession to the home of the bride. And although the bride was expecting her groom to come, uh, you know, they didn't have smartphones. They didn't even have alarm systems, okay? She knew roughly when he was coming, but she did not know the exact second that he was coming. And so because of that, as the groom was approaching, there would be a shout. And the shout would forewarn the bride to be prepared for the coming of the groom. 
And the groom would come, he would receive his bride, and he would take her back to his father's house. And shortly after the arrival, the bride and the groom would be escorted by the other members of the wedding party into the bridal chamber. We're not going to go into a whole lot of detail there, but you can only imagine. After the consummation of the marriage, the groom would step outside and would make an announcement that we would consider to be kind of funny in our day, but, but the groom would step outside the, the bridal suite and would basically announce that they were one flesh. We did it. And the celebration would occur at that time and last for seven days. And it was during this time that the bride would remain hidden in the bridal chamber. And at the conclusion of these seven days, the groom would then bring his bride out of the bridal chamber with now her veil removed and he would show off or present his bride. Now, let's move on to point number two today. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? I'm going to tell you. The church is referred to as the bride of Christ. And just as the Jewish bridegroom took the initiative in marriage by leaving his father's house and traveling to the home of the prospective bride, Jesus left his father's home in heaven at the incarnation. And he came to the home of his bride, which is the earth, over 2,000 years ago. And in the same way that the Jewish bridegroom came to the bride's home for the purpose of entering into covenant with her in the establishment of a marriage covenant, Jesus came to earth for the purpose of obtaining the church, his bride, through the establishment of a marriage covenant. In Oriental marriage, a purchase price had to be laid down to have the right to make his bride his own. The Bible says this, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock of God, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. What was the purchase price for the bride? Blood. Now, do you remember how we said that Jesus did not drink from the fourth cup? Well, that's true in a very literal sense, because he will not drink from that cup formally until the millennial kingdom. But he did drink from that cup in a figurative sense. Having agreed upon and having paid the bride price, the word of God says this, now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now this cup of wine is described as being sour or bitter, because it symbolized the cup of of God's wrath that he must drink and he did drink it and it was put on hyssop do you remember what hyssop was used for it was used during the Passover and it was dipped in blood and the blood was put over the posts and the sides of the door and even over the threshold to symbolize what that the death angel would pass over that home when he saw the blood. I find it interesting that he drank from that cup, so to speak, and then announced it's finished. And then Jesus died. He paid the price. He laid down that price to purchase his bride but guess what? He didn't stay dead. He rose again from the grave. Why? Because if he had not, then the picture would not have been complete. He rose from the dead. That was a sign that the price of redemption that was paid by Jesus had been accepted by God the Father. 
and our salvation was secured. And just as the Jewish bridegroom left the home of his bride and returned to his father's house after the marriage covenant had been established, Jesus not only rose from the dead, but he ascended back to the Father, went back to his Father's house, left the home of his prospective bride, the earth, and returned to his Father's house in heaven after he had laid down the price and risen from the dead. Now, after accepting the proposal and drinking from the cup, the bride and the groom were separated for up to a year. She was being set apart unto her husband. Again, she was referred to as someone who has been bought at a price. She was no longer single. She was off the market. You know what the problem with a lot of Christians today is? We think that we're still on the market. (laughs) We think that we're still available. No, we're not. We are being set apart for one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it is so very important that you live lives that are holy. Because you are being set apart unto Jesus. Are you preparing yourselves to be a beautiful bride? Ephesians 5, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Why? Why would he do that? Why would he sanctify her, her referring to us? So that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Is that what you are becoming today? Holy and without blemish for the sake of Christ. So right now, we are living in this time of separation, and that is why Jesus said to his disciples, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so in the same manner... As the Jewish groom came to take his bride to live with him, at the end of this period of separation, so Christ will come to claim his bride, the church. Hmm. And after returning to the father's house, the Jewish groom and bride would enter into physical union and the marriage would be consummated Even so, Christ and the church will experience a spiritual union upon our arrival at the Father's house in heaven, face to face. Isn't that going to be awesome? You know how awesome it's going to be? Because we have served him all these years and have yet to see his face. We have enjoyed what it means to spiritually have communion with him, to be in his very near presence. And that is awesome because in doing so, we are able to enjoy right now a taste of heaven. But it gets even better because when we are physically in his presence, we will be joined to him, never to be separated ever, ever, ever again. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Remember how the Jewish bride remained hidden in the bridal chamber for, chamber for a period of seven days? The church will remain hidden for a period of seven years while the seven-year tribulation is taking place on the earth. The church will be in heaven. You don't find the church in Revelation after chapter 4. will be totally hidden from the sight of those living upon the earth. And just as the Jewish groom brought his bride out of the bridal chamber at the conclusion of the seven days, had her veil removed so that everyone could see who she was. So Christ is going to bring his church with him at the close 
of the seven years. And it will be obvious to everyone who is part of the bride. And some will be thinking, wait, where's so-and-so? I thought they'd be here, and they're not. And they'll be looking at others saying, wow, I, I, I never knew. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> but it will be made plain who the real church of the living God is, who is truly a part of his bride. Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. My invitation today is very simple. Jesus looked around at the ones who were gathered with him in the upper room, and he offered them the cup. In essence, what he was asking was, will you enter into permanent relationship with me? Will you enter into covenant with me? The question he asked you this morning, and keep in mind the price has been paid, the question is, he asked, of you, will you also become mine? He says to each and every one of you today, will you become mine? Will you enter into covenant with me? He is asking you, a prospective member of his bride, will you marry me? If you're here today and you're saved, I want to challenge you. Commit to him. Be faithful to him. With a full understanding that you're not just coming to church on Easter Sunday. Don't let your Christianity be, okay, we'll see you next year. Commit to him fully with nothing held back. A full understanding that you're giving him everything. You're giving him all that you are. The price has been paid today. And he is asking you, will you become mine? And then finally, 1 Corinthians 11.26 says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today, on Resurrection Sunday, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. We remember his victory. We remember his promise to return. A time is coming soon when the Father will say, Son, Go and get your bride. And we will remember all these things until that day arrives. And it could be today. What a glorious day that's going to be. Amen? If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with God, I'd like for you to step out right now. No one's watching. Can we ask a couple of members of our praise team uh, to step right over to this corner? Right over here. A couple of members of our prayer team are stepping out, and they're coming right over to this, this corner. And if you have a question about what it means to have a genuine relationship with God through Jesus Christ, as Jesus is asking you that question today, will you enter into covenant with me? Will you allow me to forgive you of your sins and to make you a part of my people. If you're willing to say yes to that or if you have any questions about that, understand something. Everyone's heads are bowed and their eyes are closed and no one is looking around. Will you just slip up out of your chair real quick and make it over to our prayer team and a couple of them will be glad to take you into a room somewhere private and show you what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, will you step out right now? Don't put it off. Let today be a new day, a new beginning for you of eternal life in Jesus Christ. 
And if there's any of you that maybe just need some prayer, maybe you say, you know what, Pastor Steve, I, uh, I love the Lord, but I've been through so much. There's been so much going on in life. I, I got to tell you, uh, Jesus has not been my number one priority. But God has my attention today. And I want to renew my covenant with him. If that's you, do something about it. Don't just sit there and say, I ought to do this. Step out and do it. And a member of our prayer team will take you someplace private and help you to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, will you step out with all heads bowed and all eyes closed? If God is speaking to you today and you know that you need Jesus, don't wait. While the Holy Spirit of God is calling you, give in to him. You can step out right now. Father, we just want to praise you for the four cups of the Passover. And Lord, we especially want to thank you for that fourth cup. And while we look forward to drinking it with you new in your kingdom, Lord, you extend an invitation to everyone in this room today to take you by the hand and enter into covenant with you in salvation. And Lord, the truth is, I don't know the spiritual condition of everyone gathered in here today. But my hope and prayer is that they will be able to leave this place today with a tremendous sense of victory because the battle has already been won. The war has already been won. You entered into death and conquered it and rose. And because of that, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us with an everlasting love. And so, Father, as we prepare in just a few minutes to enter into a time of remembrance, I pray that you would bless us, that you would keep us, and help us today to remember the cost of eternal love and the price that's been paid. We commit this time to you, and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.